Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, this Facebook Live. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, this, this will be a special Facebook Live. I think it will be on what will be a really interesting topic. Um, today, we'll be covering secondary breast cancer and how research can help people living with uh, secondary breast cancer. So these sessions usually highlight research that we fund as a charity and the important subjects in research. So I'll just cover a few housekeepings before we get started. Um, we, so we'll be taking questions live and please do join the conversation and share your experiences. If we can't answer them live, we'll aim to respond over the next couple of days. Uh, we also have a free helpline that is available where you can speak to one of our expert nurses at 0808 800 6000. Um, and out of hours, you can also leave a voicemail and we'll phone you when we're next open, which is usually first thing in the morning. So my name's Ed, I'm a research communications officer here at Breast Cancer Now, and the, tonight we have the pleasure of being joined by two very special guests. We have Catherine Priestley, who is a clinical nurse specialist in secondary breast cancer research here at Breast Cancer Now. And we also have um, Ingen Holen, who is professor of bone oncology at the University of Sheffield and one of our trustees here at Breast Cancer Now. Uh, thank you both so much for joining tonight. How are you doing? Thank you, Ed. Yeah, very well, thank you. Yes, um, same here. Really looking forward to the session. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so I think, so tonight we're covering a big topic, secondary um, breast cancer. And I think it would be a, a great place to start would be just to kind of talk about your backgrounds um, and what, what, your, what your roles involve. So um, Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about what you do here at Breast Cancer Now? Sure, yeah. So I'm Catherine. I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists here at Breast Cancer Now. Um, we've got a big team of clinical nurse specialists, as well as people that man the helpline, the free helpline um, that you mentioned already. But as part of my role, I get involved with anything and everything to do with secondary breast cancer. So predominantly, that's writing information um, about secondary breast cancer, making sure we've got up to date information on the website, in our publications about newer drugs which is what we're talking about tonight um, and sort of what precedes that. Um, things like um, our services, so planning services. I don't plan them per se, but um, I work with the teams that do plan those services. So we have quite a, a range of uh, services for those who are living with secondary breast cancer. So if you don't know about that, then you can always give us a ring on the helpline or you can go on the website and have a look. Um, and we, I also work with the policy team because we do quite a lot of campaigning about secondary breast cancer and I also uh, really enjoy working with healthcare professionals as well and supporting healthcare professionals and making sure they've got the tools and the information to support the patients with secondary breast cancer that they're looking after um, in, the, in the hospitals out there across the UK. I'm definitely no scientist, but um, I understand the relevance of clinical trials to people with secondary breast cancer and the importance of that and, and where it's got us today and where it might get us in the future. So important for me to make sure I, I look out for everybody out there that's got a diagnosis and um, yeah, looking forward to the chat. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, and I know everyone at the charity sees your team as the superstars. So um, yeah, thank you so much for joining. Um, like, uh, and Ingen, so you're a researcher. Um, do you want to kind of talk about a bit about what your research is and, and your kind of background? So I'm at the, the other end of the spectrum, I guess, because uh, I'm a scientist. I always be, uh, I did my PhD in cancer research and then I worked in cancer industry. Yeah, how long I worked on um, secondary breast cancer and that's kind of 15 20 years um, not on of course I've had a team that do uh, interesting and it's something that we feel and uh, our team spreads to the skeleton because that's quite common when it does spread and understanding how that happens, how we can prevent it from happening, hopefully, how we can treat it when it happens, and, and around the biology. So, you know, understanding the processes, because if we don't understand those, then we can't prevent them from happening. So this basic understanding is really important. And of course, the motivation of all scientists in this area is to um, make discoveries that will impact uh, patient outcome eventually. Brilliant. And you're also a trustee, so, so could, could you talk a bit about what your role is um, as a trustee at the charity? 
as well. Yeah, so I'm very pleased to be involved with breast cancer now as a trustee. Um, and our job is really breast cancer now doing what it's on the tin uh, that is in each patient 50 everyone with breast cancer will live and be supported to live well um, but in the daily tasks of a trustee we are responsible for the kind of the overall oversight of, of breast cancer now so you can see it's the things strategy breast cancer will be doing what should we not be doing what could I the people do better than us responsibilities so but uh, our finances are in good order do the things we through we anyway it's important for the legal side so that is a well-run charity that complies with all the regulations and we also at how things change the charities are we actually achieving the goals that we want to reach and what do uh, so it's
Hi everyone, uh, sorry about that, we were having some te technical difficulties, um, but we're back, we'll get straight back into it. Um, so, yeah, uh, so I think a good place to start is what exactly is um, secondary breast cancer? So, Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about what secondary breast cancer is and why it's so important? Sure. So secondary breast cancer is when breast cancer cells that originate in the breast travel from the breast. Sometimes they're already in the lymph nodes underneath the arm. That's still primary breast cancer. But if they've spread beyond those two sites to other places in the body, so for instance, the lungs, the liver, the bones, the brain, those types of places, then that's secondary breast cancer. You've got secondary cancers that are set up elsewhere. And the important thing, and the thing that makes the difference to everybody that has a diagnosis um, uh, of this, is that we know at the moment it cannot be cured. And so this mm. makes research really, really important to strive for the future, to make sure that we can find drugs that means that we can do that, or we can keep the, the cancer under control for as long as possible, which is obviously currently the aim of treatment at the moment. And, you know, having that diagnosis and not knowing what the future holds impacts absolutely every little bit of everybody's lives that has got that diagnosis. So which is why we exist and our services exist to be able to support people. Of course, yeah. And, and so we've had a question from Louise, which is why can't secondary, ca breast, can um, secondary breast cancer be cured? And I guess like over the course of this, um this live would kind of talk a lot about like the kind of factors that result in why that's the case um and so i thought a good place to start so I th i've split the research that we're doing and the kind of big questions when it comes to secondary breast cancer into four different areas and i think a good place to start would be um we don't know enough about why and how breast cancer spreads to other parts of the body like what those mechanisms are um, and is this something that you see a lot in your work, Catherine? Uh, it comes up all the time in our helpline. So we mentioned the helpline a little bit earlier before we had to go off uh, for the technical difficulties, but our Ask Our Nurses service, our email service that people can contact us on um, and through um, the other sort of social media and, and any other way than the Ask Our Nurse services there. And through our services, people often ask us, why is it that secondary breast cancer can't be cured? And that is a really big question, but I think the answer, and it's always really difficult to give a, an accurate answer, uh, but the answer is that actually we, at the moment, the way that we diagnose uh, secondary breast cancer is by the use of scans and we need something to be quite big before it can be seen on a scan. So by the time it's got those millions and millions of, and squillions of, 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 of cells that are making up that secondary tumour or tumours, depending on you know how many you've got, then the likelihood is because of the way it's spread, and I didn't explain that earlier, but it's spread through the blunt, blood and through the lymphatic system, then you can't be sure and usually, although you can see something on a scan the likelihood is that there are other cells going off in other directions as well to make other tumors and doing you know and, and setting up the tumors elsewhere so we're often asked why can you not just remove the one that's in my bone in my lung in my liver in the same way as i had surgery to my breast before but even though mm. we know that we could remove those if it's safe to do so then the likelihood is you've always left something behind so it, it makes it a really difficult you know being or thing to be able to uh, to be able to to chase and to cure and that's why treatments generally are drug treatments for secondary breast cancer which travel all the way around the body in the hopes that you're going to be able to kill off those cells and keep that cancer under control so mm. um, hopefully that that does actually explain my perspective of, uh, of of why we can't cure it yeah brilliant that was great thank you yeah and and i think something that's always coming up um, and something that's talked about a lot in the research world is the tumour microenvironment. And um, Ingen, I was wondering if you could explain what that is exactly and why it's so important when it comes to secondary breast cancer. Yeah, so um, the tumour isn't just made out of cancer cells. I think the number one, it's got a lot of other cells in there as well, which um, are basically normal cells that the tumour kind of... Um, makes work for them so for example blood vessels um, are absolutely essential for a tumor to be able to grow to a certain size and become a problem so it sort of co-opts the normal blood vessels to to sprout new branches if you like and and develop that blood supply that the tumor needs and it's surrounded by normal cells that eventually are impacted by the fact that there is a tumor in the neighborhood it sort of changes its neighbors if you like and uh, 
all of that normal tissue around the tumor, we call the tumor microenvironment, and also the, the cells within the tumor that aren't tumor cells, that aren't cancer cells. And uh, many of these cells we really don't want to damage with our treatments. And that's one of the challenges around secondary breast cancer is that we could possibly find some ways of killing everything but that would be really bad for the patient so you know the toxicities would be too big so um, there's always a balancing act there between what we can kind of theoretically do and what what is practical so mm -hmm. that that's part of the challenge with secondary but, mm. uh, yeah yeah and we, we had some interesting results from um, one of the researchers we fund where they are uh, talking about that how other cells are involved with cancer spreading around the body and they found that um that, that there's certain cells called fibroblasts that can help cancer spread and they've been testing they found a, a protein called wnt7a um that can be uh kind of analyzed to assess the risk of that tumor spreading and and the hope is that it could pick the best treatment or even lead to a treatment that will a new treatment that can target those cells and stop that process from happening and so i guess that highlights really how important it is that we understand the tumor microenvironment. Um, and of course, like your work is on um, bone. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, the breast cancer sp spreads to many different sites around the body. Um, each one differs, I suppose. And so the bone has a very different environment to the uh, brain. Um, and would you say that's also a significant thing that we need to understand is the difference between yeah, those environments? That's uh, absolutely correct that we see that uh, a tumor that spreads to lung or to bone or to brain doesn't look exactly the same you know it it's it adapts to, the, to that new environment and it's that that's really one of the things that cancer does well is to go somewhere else and be able to grow there just find a way of changing the the way they produce proteins, for example, to, that makes them able to survive and colonize that new site. And if we can interfere with that ability, and we can change the environment, perhaps we can, you know, make the soil inhospitable so that cancer <laughs> cells can't uh, thrive there. Then that's one aspect of it, and that's what we do actually in, when we. Uh, protect bone from from cancer growth uh, it is to change the bone surface so that the cancer cells are less happy there they still manage but they are much slowed down so some treatments are actually targeted completely not at the tumor but at the surrounding environment mm. but, uh, so there is we, we're trying every which way and there's mm. a lot of interesting research going on uh, of many different aspects of trying to just hit a tumor from all different directions and eventually make it just uh, not able to survive and thrive yeah it's a really I mean, good way of ooh, being sorry. able to describe it actually i really like that that you said about the soil because actually if you think about seed and seeds and soils then you if your seeds are the cancer cells you need to sort out what what you can do about the seeds so that they don't grow but you can also alter the soil around it to make sure it can't grow even if you can't alter the seed would that be mm. right is that is that sort of a, a correct analogy in that sense yeah it's one that we often use actually when we teach our students about that, that there is a, a, a fairly old hypothesis actually from 1889 uh, called the seed and soil um, system of, of how cancer spread to bone and the person who put it forward said you know it's not enough to have a good seed you also have to have a, a welcoming soil and if you, you you should be able to to attack both of those in order to prevent tumor growth so and that's mm. what we're still doing today but uh, i would like to say we are increasingly successful and s some sites are easier than others you know brain is a particular challenge mm. uh, bone is probably where we are the most <clears throat> successful yeah, and there's some really, really exciting kind of research going on that's finding new, really innovative ways to treat secondary. And, you know, for instance, like Im immunotherapy is a really uh, interesting area that's quite, that's become a focus. And um, I guess the way that we develop these immunotherapies and, and improve them and make them better is, is by understanding how the immune system interacts with breast cancer and those, those seeds, like you said. Um, and so, yeah, one of our researchers, um, 
Seth Koff felt he's looking at particular uh, white blood cells and how that stops the um, immune system recognizing cancer cells. But he wants to like, find a treatment that can allow the immune system to recognize again. And it, and it shows that it's such a, comp uh, you know, when I was at university, I remember that we've learned very basic understandings of how breast cancer spreads. But the more you get into it, there are these multi front approaches that we can take with treatment. Um, and I guess understanding the tumor microbiome is vital to that. Um, really interesting stuff. Thank you. Um, so I guess the second point I'd like to move on to, which is kind of highlighted as a big need within research is new ways to detect breast cancer returning or spreading to other parts of the body. Um, don't at the earliest possible stage don't currently currently exist. So, um, Catherine, I was wondering if you wanted to come in on that and, and talk a bit about what that means and, and why it's important. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that actually when, you know, by the time we can find uh, secondary breast cancers, wherever they've, uh, you know, wherever they are in the lungs, the liver, etc., by using imaging, then they have to be a certain size to be able to be seen. You can't see things that are microscopic. But if we could, and if the research that all of these really clever people, including Ingen, are doing, could be able to find those cells earlier before they've actually set up those secondary cancers, what difference would that that make so looking at the circulating dna of those tumor cells might be a way of being able to pick things up earlier it certainly would be a little bit simpler as far as a patient is concerned because you can take a blood test and somebody needs to do the hard work in the lab rather than putting people through um, biopsies that might be uncomfortable that might be a little bit risky those sorts of things um, so at the moment we wait for people to be able to display symptoms to be able to follow up usually um, and investigate those symptoms to see if there's any evidence of secondary breast cancer sometimes some people do actually discover that they've got secondary breast cancer by chance if they're having a, a scan for something different completely unrelated but that actually it shows up um, and some people who are on trials might have particularly regular follow-up as part of the criteria for the trials um, and so have regular scans etc for that and it might be that it shows up on there so if we could reliably and I guess that's the really key thing isn't it reliably find um, spread or potentially that spread um, earlier or signs of spread earlier then it may be possible because you might be able to you'd be able to start treatment earlier it may be possible to be able to change the outlook of things for people and whether that is lengthening the time to well, you know to to the when their cancer progresses or whether it is actually making a difference to overall survival so i think you know the work that all of the researchers do is incredibly important there, there are quite a few trials out there at the moment nothing that i'm aware of that is in routine clinical practice and that's something else that we're often asked about is there a blood test i can have instead of a scan uh, we don't routinely scan people for the reasons that I've, I've explained. It doesn't seem to make a difference to outcomes at the moment. But if you could make that difference and mm. you could exploit those cancer cells much earlier, then there is that possibility. Yeah, and you, and you talked about cells being too small, um, groups of cells being too small when they spread around the body, which don't come up on scans. Um, Ingen, would you like, could you just talk a bit about what micrometastases are and why they're important or significant in secondary breast cancer? So and the, these things called micrometastases are basically the teeny tiny metastases that are too small to be seen but are still kind of put, growing. And that's where um, the circulating DNA comes in. So these cells will kind of shed their little bits of their genetic material into the circulation, into the bloodstream. And so we can take blood samples and we can detect that that bit of DNA and say, okay, this came from a cancer cell. What that does, doesn't say is, where is this cancer cell? And that's where the scans are important. Like Catherine said, you know, they come in later when the tumor is bigger, but then, and then we can see where it is. So is it in the bone? Is it in the brain? And that might be important in terms of deciding what treatment you would consider. Uh, whereas the, if we find a little bit of cancer DNA in your circulation, we don't know where that came from. So then we're back to those kind of the drug treatments that are kind of go everywhere or in future, I think immunotherapy 
would be great because if we can kind of train the immune system to, to recognize uh, the cancer cells or support the immune system to to be more effective at eradicating cancer cells then then that that's really great because the immune cells can go anywhere we don't need to find the cancer cells the immune cells will do that for us and so that they have that sort of seek and destroy function which is what we all would like to see uh, but um, and I, I'm optimistic, you know, that research is moving in that direction mm -hmm. constantly. So the things that we can do now, we couldn't dream of 10 years ago. So I would like people to, to, to know that, you know, things are happening and things are changing all the time. Yeah, and, and we've, we've had some really uh, great results with uh, blood tests, which look for ctDNA, like you said. I mean, there's one... Uh, researcher we fund who and their their research found that um, using a blood test could detect the return of the disease after treatment on average 10.7 months before patients developed symptoms or secondary uh, tumors became visible on scans and like you said that's incredibly important and now that that work is now going on into clinical trials to see how these uh, new diagnostic techniques could work in the health system so um, like you said yeah there's some really exciting research and, and it's really you know, there's, there's been some incredible positive uh, movements in that area. Um, you know, we've also had uh, a, a blood test um, that analyzes, um, sorry, a test that analyzes DNA present in the spinal fluid. Um, and it found that it could diagnose 100% of people um, if their disease had uh, spread to the, um, the lining of the brain. Um, and so there's, yeah, incredible research going on. Um, so I think the third point, uh, we could move on to is uh, we can't easily predict who is most likely to develop secondary breast cancer. Um, and so we need to find better ways to identify who's at higher risk of spreading um, of, of their disease spreading so that we can switch into a more appropriate treatment. And Catherine, would you like to come in on that again and kind of explain? Why yeah, so important. we've actually got a question from Emma um, that sort of relates to this as well, because she's asked, is there any type of breast cancer that's more likely to go on to have a secondary cancer mm. later on? So we know that everybody's risk of developing recurrence, of get, getting secondary breast cancer in the future is different. And it depends on an awful lot of things. So it's not just one individual thing. There's a picture. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle and you having to, to build those the, build those little pieces together to get an overall picture. And that might signify that somebody has more or less risk of that. I don't think we can ever say that somebody is definitely always going to go on and develop secondary breast cancer in the same way as, unfortunately, even people who are really, really low risk, we can't say never will it happen low risk isn't no risk unfortunately so there are ways that treatment teams would be able to talk to people about their risk about their individual risk and it is individual um, there are computer programs there's something called nhs predict that uh, teams will use to be able to help people see what benefit treatment gives them and then what risk there might be of their them developing secondary breast cancer in the future i guess as a nurse I always want to say to people that it's really helpful for you to think about knowing your risk and, you know, before you ask those sorts of questions, it's one of those things that often came up in the consultations and sometimes maybe somebody, you know, husband or wife or whoever it is might ask those questions, but it takes, it's, it's worth just having a little think about, would you want to know the intricacies of that risk? Because if it's something that actually you find really difficult to manage, you'd be difficult to cope with, it's not what you were expecting to hear, then it's really difficult to unhear that and manage it. So it, it's worth having a little think. But some people do want that level of information. They want mm. a lot of detail. So I suppose to answer Emma's question is there are a couple of, um, you know, there are um, triple negative, for instance, is uh, has got that bit extra risk of developing into secondary breast cancer. That's not to say that everybody with triple negative will develop secondary breast cancer. Um, and, you know, the difference that research has made and treatments because of research is made to people who are having treatment now and in the past few years, particularly for those people who are HER2 positive, is once upon a time when people were HER2 positive, we knew that had a much higher risk as well. But fortunately, the treatments that we have now now, thankfully, 
due to all of those people that went into trials and all the research that went on before those drugs actually are getting the benefit of those treatments today. So that does make a big difference and that has brought that risk down. So everybody is different, I guess, is the bottom line of that. But always worth sort of speaking to your team just a little bit more about that, but thinking about it if if you want to do that. So ho hopefully that answers the question. No, that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, there's some really incredible technology that's being developed to kind of deal with this. And I feel like, you know, AI, it's a it's, pro it's a topic that we could probably do a whole live on in itself. Um, but Ingen, how, like just talking briefly, like how important are technologies like AI when it comes to research at, lar at large in general or in particular um, in, in this area of, of predict predicting people? Yeah, so it's broadly what we call artificial intelligence it's it's modeling basically it's feeding all the data into the computer and saying you know training it to see many 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 thousands of cases and saying this is what happened what can we learn from them much more than the the human brain can do and then there's this scary thing called computer algorithms that then spit out an answer to say you know based on three million cases this is the likelihood and that is helpful, but it still is something we need to be very careful to interpret in context that, you know, the data that we put into that model may come from different countries, different treatments, different, uh, you know, types of breast cancer. And that makes it really quite um, difficult to say this is very clean and very easy and very precise but we're getting better at it all the time and there's no doubt that you know this sort of big computing power that is somewhat scarily i think called artificial intelligence but it's basically ways of of understanding large amounts of data and patterns in that data and then using that information to make decisions about which way to go you know is this treatment better is this uh, type of breast cancer requiring treatment a or treatment b based on not just the cases that your doctor has seen but all the cases we know about almost you know that mm. that that is uh, give, gives us much more power to make accurate decisions so it is important it is a tool it is still something that we're learning a lot about how best to apply. But uh, I, I think it's changed so much because it's given us access to so much information and, and the possibility of understanding that on a, on a larger scale. And that will help individuals for sure. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, uh, we had some results come out um, this year about um, so researchers from uh, our research unit at King's College London developed an AI model that could predict, um, it basically analysed the lymph nodes to see um, if secondary breast cancer was likely to spread. Um, but like you've both said, um, that that's fantastic. It's great to have those tools and, and, and um, to use, but it's how do we use them? How do we use them in the in the wider setting of healthcare? And, um, and use that sensitively because like you said there's a lot of it can provide a lot of information but how do we use that information um and also you know how important england is is information like finding new biomarkers because that's central to kind of all breast cancer um yeah but how important is it for secondary in particular <clears throat> well it is what we've already talked about so a biomarker is something we can measure in a sample to say this is what's going on. And um, the circulating DNA that we talked about, for example, is a biomarker. It's, it's something we can measure in your blood sample to say, there's more of this, there's less of this, this is what we will do next. And the, the more of those we have, um, and the more precise they are to actually say, this isn't just a breast cancer, this is this type of breast cancer. And this isn't just a very low number this is a big number those kind of things that that's what biomarkers can tell us and the good thing about them is that if they are measurable in a blood sample like Catherine said it's it's relatively easily accessible you know compared to taking a, a, a sample a biopsy of a tumor 
we can take serial samples over time. We can, uh, it's easy for the patient to just provide a blood sample and we can measure this biomarker, whatever it is, to say, nothing going on here. This is, this is okay. And mm -hmm. it's used in many other cancers, you know, uh, quite successfully that as, as a monitoring tool of, of kind of, yeah, this is quiet and all good. We're not quite there with breast cancer yet because of course, we, we remove the primary tumour uh, very early on. It's the first thing that happens in most cases. So for a long time, there's nothing to measure. Mm. But So we're back to that sort of how often would we take a sample of people and, and, and who would we, would we choose? Uh, so it, it's complicated, but it's definitely something that a lot of researchers are working on to say, this is what the primary tumor looked like. This is the markers that that tumor had. Can we now pick that up somewhere else in the blood sample or on, or even on a scan, but that's kind of more complicated. So yeah, biomarkers are our friends. Uh, <laughs> they just need to be developed and tested very rigorously so that we don't worry a lot of people unnecessarily. Mm. You know, and that that is the flip side of 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 frequent monitoring is that you're always a patient. You're always being kind of monitored to see if bad things are going on. And not that's not for everybody either. So it's always a balancing act. Yeah. And I guess from a patient perspective, you know, to hear about biomarkers and think, oh, wow, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? To have a blood test, find a biomarker and then be able to give me the correct treatment. But of course, at the moment, We've got very few biomarkers that we've married up, if you like, twinned with the right treatment. So there's no point in looking for biomarkers if you know you haven't developed those treatments, because that would be really very unfair to people to be able mm. to find that. So research will look around that, but hopefully in the not too distant future, we will have more treatments that match more biomarkers to, to help people to help people out. Um, and and Hillary's asking how long before all of, you know, a lot of new research will come online to treat those of us already diagnosed with secondary breast cancer. And that can unfortunately take quite, you know, a good number of years. You've got all of the work that you do in the lab and then that needs to be translated into finding a drug and then also trialing the drugs as well. So it's really difficult to get your head round when you are one of those people with that diagnosis because it feels like it's out of reach. Um, I suppose you know there is there is it is worth just repeating that you know an awful lot of people an awful lot of research has gone on um in the past to get us where we are now and i've certainly noticed the difference in the last nine years that i've been in my role as to what's available and what's what's not but of course there's never enough and and we recognize that which makes the ongoing sort of research that you and your your teams do incredibly incredibly important Mm. And, and that brings us really nicely onto our next point, Hiller's question and what you were saying about biomarkers and treatment. Um, and that is, you know, and I feel like everything we've spoken about so far all boils down to treatments are limited for people with secondary breast cancer and we need to uh, find new treatments. And, and that's what, uh, and so I guess, Catherine, how is, how is the secondary breast cancer currently treated? What are the options? Oh, gosh, I mean, that's quite a, that's a Facebook Live in itself, really. And I think one that we've done in the past. But, you know, in the same way as everybody's risk is different because of the biology of the cancer, then their treatment is also going to be individualized and tailored to them because of the biology of their treatment. Not just the biology, maybe because of the site or how much cancer they've got in particular areas of their body. So just a, a very, very broad outline is things that I've already said that we use drug treatment. So that's treatment that will travel all the way around the body there are things for certain people surgery for certain people radiotherapy they tend to be used or certainly radiotherapy tends to be used to help with symptoms tend with pain pain control that type of thing but for the majority of the people their mainstay of their treatment will be drug treatment that travels around their body whether that's tablets they're taking or whether that's chemotherapy or other targeted treatments that uh, that they're being given so we have chemotherapy we still have chemotherapy which is a good treatment but as Ingen said right at the beginning you know 
we're wanting to try and look at treatments that will target the cancer cells rather than other things, other cells around, um, around the, the sort of tumour and other cells in the body. So kinder and smarter treatments is what research is helping us do there. And also these targeted treatments of which we've got quite a few, HER2 positive breast cancer I already mentioned, things like Herceptin and Pajeta, and there's a numerous other ones that have gone completely out of my head just now um, <laughs> that we can use these days. There, is, there are more for HER2 positive um, breast cancer patients, but also we're using targeted treatments alongside hormone therapy. So hormone therapy is not giving hormones, it's actually doing quite the opposite. It's reducing or stopping the action of hormones in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So all of these things can be given in sort of partnerships, um, a little bit more often these days but quite often treatments are given on their own and in a sequence so that once um, a treatment has actually you know become um, ineffective so that the cancer has continued has, has begun to grow again rather than being kept under control um, then you can move on to, the, to another one and obviously that's a really important thing is to be able to for, for researchers to be able to look as to why um, you know resistance happens to drug why it lasts for so long and then suddenly it stops working again because cancer is incredibly clever and does manage to get around that at some mm. point in the future so again mm. you know that this is now back to back to ingen and and you know all the people that who are doing the research to be able to make roads into finding what what we can do to be able to stop that resistance because that also would help so there are an armory of things you know an oncologist fingertips to be able to use but it's important to also help and see whether you know whether the research can come up with ways to find out those sorts of things and therefore develop newer treatments on using existing treatments and stopping resistance to them mm. and yeah so Ingen, what what are the kind of scientific theories around how resistance occurs do we is it i imagine it's complicated like a lot of things yeah. are with, with breast cancer <laughs> but um yeah what do we have any prevailing theories as to how that happens i th i think it's different from each drug unfortunately and that's what we see uh, in, in that we have new drugs that come online and we think great this one's going to make a big difference and they do for a while but then it's not until we've actually used them on quite a number of patients and over quite a long period of time that then suddenly we can see that, oh, they're not working anymore. What happened there? So, you know, the, the research into resistance is sort of lagging behind in a way because we first have to see that actually happen. And for each drug that acts in a different way, the, the mechanisms of resistance can be quite different. So it, mm. it all is back to you know, each type of drug. But in, in, in common to the question we had about, uh, you know, what's coming for us now, who, who are in the middle of it now, I, I would like to just say that um, there are lots of trials that are completing all the time. There, there is a pipeline of stuff coming. So uh, NICE is approving new drugs in this metastatic setting on a regular basis. So as and, and I think that's something that's improved a lot over the last few years, that as soon as something, the trials are positive, they make their way into clinical practice quite quickly in the UK and people have access to them. So it's not like we now have to wait 10 years for me and my team to find something new. There is a constant stream of stuff coming almost every year. There's a new drug for a new, maybe a, a subgroup of patients. So a, a, not for everybody, but for a group of patients with a particular type of cancer and a particular marker on their tumour. Like Catherine said, you know, if you her to positive tumour, then there are lots of options suddenly that we didn't have um, maybe five years ago, and they're, on, they're coming now. So in the next five years, there'll be another uh, bunch of drugs coming through. So it's not a, it's not a sort of a stop-go anymore. Mm. Um, it's mm. actually a constant stream of new stuff. So, you know, research is really translating into the clinic now, which I think is a really important point because I do often get asked, you know, why I haven't cured this yet if, if I've had so much money spent on it, etc. And I think people forget that, you know, for, for many, we do do 
for many there is a cure, they come to do not come back. And, and for many we do manage to prolong the disease into almost a chronic disease. And that's, um, that's you know, I, I'd take a chronic disease any day if, if that was, if the alternative is that I, I don't survive my cancer. So, but of course, what we really want is to be able to make sure that everybody survives their breast cancer diagnosis. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, moving uh, in that direction, hopefully, slowly but slowly. Mm, yeah, and I'm, they, I mean, there's some really amazing kind of uh, research going on that's looking at uh, smart ways to find new drugs. I mean, we had uh, an achievement this year where one of our researchers discovered that a drug used to treat um, that to treat lung cancer could be repurposed for um, breast cancer, and so he's currently work, like doing more research, and, and that could go into clinical trials to see how whether that's a possible option. But you know, there, there's always these kind of um, in, interesting areas that people that people perhaps wouldn't necessarily think of that are drugs that are for a particular uh, other cancer or other disease can be repurposed, and that's also an avenue. It's not it's not just about finding the new ones, I guess. Um, and I and I know we've got a project um, looking at. Palbus uh, cichlid as well, and it's trying to understand how resistance arises in um, Palbus cichlid. And you also had a project, Ingen, I think, with us previously, didn't you, uh, which was looking at um, Palbus cichlid. Um, and so could you talk a bit, a bit about that drug and what your research found um, in that area? Yeah, yeah, just to, to, to keep it simple, I guess, is th so this particular drug, Palbus cichlid, was a, is a new type of drug that came online for a few years ago and initially it was used in a particular setting and we weren't sure whether it would work in patients with bone metastasis for example and so in that's obviously what we specialize in, in in my team and we thought if we can get this drug and we managed to get grant from breast cancer now to work on it and and to test it in our model systems to see whether it would be effective and it was it was amazing it, it really was and that was in triple negative breast cancer that had spread to the skeleton uh, in our model systems i have to say and you know increasingly now they are looking at um you know translating these sorts of findings that we see in the lab saying you know this could work this might be worth a, a try in in the metastatic setting so uh, we're not taking that forward because we're not clinicians, but uh, we've provided that evidence and we've published that in, in you know, in the, in the journal. So other scientists and other clinicians can read it and say, ah, yeah, this is this could this could work. We could do this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an important point because it shows that when a new drug appears and we can get access to it, we can see oh, maybe it could work in this setting, or maybe it could work here, maybe it, maybe it could work for this, maybe we can combine it with this thing, you know, and that's where lab research is really important because we can do things in the lab, in, especially in terms of combinations of drugs that you wouldn't have kind of time to do in the patient, it would be too experimental and too dangerous, whereas we can kind of find those good kind of combinations perhaps in the lab and then say, these are the ones that we think are really interesting to pursue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and that that kind of collaboration aspect is so important in science, isn't it? Like sharing that knowledge and, and giving that to other people so that they can use it for their research. And it's such a central tenant of research. Um, and that kind of brings us nicely onto our next um, topic, which we've had a couple of questions about um, clinical trials. Um, so we've had a question from Steph, which is, any current research or, or clinical trials for stage four triple negative breast cancer um, or CAR has asked, are there any drugs being researched now which could be available in two or three years time? And I think this this would be a really good opportunity in the last kind of five or so minutes to talk about uh, how these clinical, what are trials? Why are they important? Um, do you want to talk both a bit about that? What, what um, Catherine, I know you probably get quite a few questions about clinical trials. 
Yeah, we do. I mean, I think we've established that actually what Ingen and her colleagues do to be able to sort of make the difference and find out behaviours of cells, obviously, is the precursor to finding treatments that might work and then being able to actually test them on bigger populations. Um, so, you know, second, uh, uh, clinical trials are a big part or, or can be a big part of a lot of people's treatment journey, if I'm allowed to say that, that sort of phrase, um, as part of treatment and no longer are clinical trials or oh, a last desperate attempt they are the opportunity to bring something in into a treatment pathway for an individual treatment but might actually involve a, a drug or two that have been around for quite some time but as Ingen's just said you know testing combinations and seeing what uh, what how they how they work can actually help us formulate new treatments so um, you know an awful lot of people do ask us about trials and I'm really pleased to say that you know now on the helpline and and through our services we do a huge amount of, um, of signposting to make seconds count so if you've got secondary breast cancer and you've not heard of make seconds count they do quite a few things they've got support etc but one of the things that I'm really interested in really really pleased to be able to direct people to is their patient trials advocate service so they've got three research nurses that work for that service and it aims to give people information about trials what they are what they aren't because there's quite a few myths out of there you know am I a guinea pig what's that going to be like am I being tested out you you know the, the trials that are out there that were on patients you wouldn't never get less than standard treatment so it's sort of just myth busting in that sort of sense but it it gives people the opportunity to make a decision have an inf information that will help them make an informed decision whether they're looking at thinking about a trial just now because maybe their treatment stopped working or whether it is in the future but it helps people make a decision an awful lot of people have said one well, if i ask my oncologist they're a bit oh no not now or you know i'm not quite they're not quite up to date with things so what that service can also do is point people in directions and depending on the information that's given is also highlight some of the trials that might be they might be eligible for um, if it's appropriate for them to join um, now. So um, yeah, so a great service. You can self-refer if you go to their website and hopefully we'll be able to put that um, that link into the uh, into the comments box underneath uh, this uh, this broadcast. Um, then you can go, you can self-refer and you can book an appointment with one of the one of the teams and have a 45 minutes an hour type free appointment just to be able to talk through time um, to, to be able to talk through trials the other thing that makes seconds count and the nurses do for us is come along to our services as well and we've got an online session on the 14th of November um, which is going to be me talking a little bit but also one of the uh, nurses Vivian from make seconds count and she will talk through a bit more about trials in the sense of patient trials and also about the, the pros and cons of that and those sorts of things as well and about the patient trials advocacy service the other thing that um, they've done also is um, there are various places to be able to try and find trials so we often get questions about how can I find a trial obviously I've already said that the girls can help people do that if they so wish if that's appropriate for them but there are the websites be part of research cancer research UK and um, but make seconds count have put together a UK clinical trials registry and it separates it out into triple negative HER2 positive HER2 negative hormone uh, receptor positive those sorts of things so it helps people find and have a look to see what exactly is going on. The phase of trials, which Vivian would talk about in that session on the 14th of November, we, I know we haven't covered really any of that this evening, um, and just let people have a look at seeing what's out of there. And I think I was quite amazed when I sort of just updated myself this, uh, this afternoon, just looking to see what's on there at the amount and type of trials that are on there. Um, so uh, yeah, so if anybody wants to attend that session, you can ring the helpline on 0808 800 6000 or you can have a look at our Living with Secondary Breast Cancer online services and send us an email from the website there to be able to register to attend that session um, if you'd like. So I think, you know, from my perspective, it's brilliant to have that resource out there with some brilliant experts that can help people, you know, get, get that information and help them make their minds up whether trials is something that they would really like to sort of have a look at in the future. Yeah, and it's also worth mentioning that our, our website is also fantastic for finding um, clinical trials. We have a great web, 
page on that. And also the Cancer Research UK have a really great directorate yep. um, for finding um, clinical trials. Um, but yeah, it, it's amazing that there's um, incredible initiatives like like that out there um, like that you described, Catherine, because it can be quite overwhelming. And so it's great to know that there's yeah. um, those options out there. I'm sadly not the sort of person that can memorise all of these things and sort of repeat them. But, um, but it, it, <laughs> well, it's so reassuring to me for people who want to know more about clinical trials, whether it's right for them to make their own make mind up and whether, you know, there is something out there that they might be able to access at, currently um that's there so um you know we we do routinely now um you know refer to them and yeah we'd welcome anybody that would like to come along to that session on the 14th of november you'd be really really welcome it's a virtual session just a little bit like this on the zoom but it means that you can ask questions as well so we'd love to see you come along fantastic and in, in, in just the last couple of minutes do you want to talk quickly about why clinical trials are so important in the world of research and and how what they kind of do yeah I mean, they're essential, really. We, without uh, the clinical trials, we wouldn't have new treatments. We wouldn't have any treatments or any scans or any blood tests. You know, it's research and, and trials are at the bottom of everything. And if um, the reason why we are talking about, you know, new treatments coming on stream all the time, mm -hmm. even, in, even for secondary breast cancer, and there's been a lot of good positive data from from big trials in the last few years showing that we can improve survival um, and that's because some people have said yes I want to be in this clinical trial and we're forever grateful to the patients who do come forward um, we desperately want a more diverse patient population to come forward actually we, we, we really would encourage people to engage with that um, it isn't experimenting on you, like Catherine said. It's very uh, strictly regulated, and and it's about you know can we improve on what's currently the best and make it even better. So you'll get the best, and we want to make it even better. And if we don't do these clinical trials, then we will not move forward. And all the research is, of course, then completely wasted because we'll just find out what possibly could work but we won't ever find out whether it did or not mm. so it, it's just that that continuum of research into the what's called early phase trials where we first try you know on a few patients to say is it is it very toxic is it is it okay and then you kind of escalate into the the bigger and bigger trials and and to eventually say yes this does work uh, or not and it's important to know what doesn't work as well so we don't waste resources on uh, in the wrong direction and we don't give patients loads of treatments that they don't benefit from because they don't work for them for whatever reason so we need to understand what doesn't work just research into that as well it's obviously more fun to work on stuff that that does make a difference but as a researcher i just want to know uh, either way so that we can move forward and, and just leave all the, the, the blind alleys behind and just you know progress in the right direction so yeah clinical trials are super important and mm. I'm, I'm delighted that there are so many going on in, in the metastatic setting yeah absolutely and, and it's really you know like you said it's so important to note that like you said earlier about sharing that knowledge that um it's all about collaboration it's not just about collaboration between researchers we also need people to take part in those clinical trials we need diverse populations because things work differently for different people and so um yeah it's it's so important and it just shows doesn't it how uh how many people are involved in in research and these projects um brilliant i think that's a fantastic place to end tonight's session um i hope everyone's found this as interesting as I have, it was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Ingen and Catherine, for joining um, and You're giving welcome. up your evening. Um, yeah, Can I, I just so want much. to remind everybody about the helpline. So 0808 800 6000, we're there to talk to 
anybody that is affected by breast cancer, whether you're a friend of somebody, whether you might have a symptom. We get lots of people that are worried that might have a sign or a symptom of secondary breast cancer. We speak to an awful lot of people with secondary breast cancer. And obviously, you know, things like this, when people are listening along today, we've talked about, you know, hope for the future, but it can still sometimes be quite difficult to manage that and to contain that sort of hope and think about the future and when people are living with uncertainty. So we're here to support you through our living with secondary breast cancer services and there are quite a few and I've mentioned the session in, in um, November um, and also our younger women with secondaries together events two-day events so if you're 45 and under and you've got, got diagnosis of secondary breast cancer then we've got a two-day event um, that's not too distant in November um, I think that's going to be up in Manchester um, and we have a, a session on re research and trials um, in that as well um, so yeah we're here to support you um, give us a, a ring on the helpline or drop us a line um, through our Ask Our Nurses service. Um, we'd, we'd love to be able to respond to you. There are a couple of questions that have come up from Joanne and Heather that we haven't uh, covered tonight, but Joanne and Heather, we will definitely respond to you. I will be doing Absolutely. that tomorrow. Yeah, and I'll also be answering any questions um, that, that come up as well. I'll be helping Catherine out. Um, Ingen, do you want to mention anything in the last signing off comments? Um, I, th I think I would just reiterate that um, people with secondary breast cancer, you're not forgotten. There's a lot of research effort going into this. We, we, we do care and we do want to change it. So it's, it's, you know, it's, I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating for me. It feels like we should be moving faster, but the good thing is that we are moving and that organizations like Breast Cancer Now support the research that will make a difference and continue to make a difference. So, um, I, th I think I just want to, you know, say re research is, is important and, it, and remember it does make a difference. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, I just want to also mention that every all the research we've spoken about tonight, uh, you can find more about that on our website, as well as all the other research we fund. Um, please do go and check that out because there's some incredible research going on. And um, that's at breastcancernow.org forward slash secondary research. Um, and thank you so much for joining. Um, I will see you in the next research live, possibly either at the end of November or December. Uh, see you next time. Thank you so much and good night. Thanks, Ed. Thank you.